The exploration exploitation dilemma is a problem that we all face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, for some reason, people like to use restaurants as an example to motivate the problem. Um, do you choose to go to the same restaurant that you've gone to many times before and that's worked for you in the past? Or do you try out something new that has a potentially a bigger upside, but there's also some uncertainty to it? And it's been a lot of work in the computer science literature and machine learning about how to solve that problem in order to maximize the rewards that an agent might achieve. Uh, but it turns out that that problem is very difficult to solve in all but the most simplest circumstances. Nevertheless, there are a few heuristics that people have used to try to solve this problem. For example, you can just randomly explore on some proportion of trials and exploit on other percentage of trials, and that can help to try to optimize the rewards. Or you can take a little bit more of a strategic approach and you could represent in some way the uncertainty about the likelihood that your exploratory actions might produce a better outcome than what you've achieved so far, and use that measure of uncertainty to drive exploration. In the past, we've done some studies to show that in some environments, people seem to be sensitive to this uncertainty to drive their exploratory actions. But it turns out that some people are more sensitive than others, and in fact, there's actually a genetic correlate that's related to uh, prefrontal cortical function, where people who have one form of a gene that associated with higher levels of catecholamines in the prefrontal cortex are more likely to use uncertainty to guide exploration. And that ability, the ability to take a fairly abstract um, representation or contextual representation like a goal, a plan, or in this case relative uncertainty and use it to choose one response over another that might be more prepotent um, is something that's long been associated with the prefrontal cortex. And so as a consequence it's not, it's not surprising that um, a lot of prior work has associated um, prefrontal systems with exploratory behavior. A lot of work has now suggested that as one goes from motor cortex in the most uh, caudal portion of frontal cortex um, rostrally towards the frontal pole, that um, control over action and the type of representations and processes involved become um, progressively abstract. And one way that they become more abstract is in terms of um, sort of nested operations. The idea that at the most rostral portions of frontal cortex, and specifically the rostral lateral prefrontal cortex, those neurons support operations computed over other operations. So relative uncertainty is a good example of that type of, of processing demand. To test this idea, of course, we don't want to uh, ask people to make decisions about what restaurants to go to and so forth, but we want to uh, be able to quantify exactly how much uncertainty people have about their decisions and about the potential reward uh, statistics associated with their choices. So to do that, we have an experiment on a computer where we ask people to make responses at different times, and they're told in advance that they can either respond fast or slow, and that one of them is going to produce a better outcomes than another, and in some conditions it's better to respond fast, and in other conditions it's better to respond slow. And so when they're doing that, we can actually keep track of the reward statistics that they've gotten for when they've responded fast versus when they responded slow. And we can update on a trial by trial basis what their expected value should be of those responses based on their reward history. And also that allows us to keep track of the uncertainty about that value using a, a simple Bayesian statistic approach. And by quantifying that statistic about how, much, how uncertain they are about the outcomes for one response versus another, we can then predict, do they actually make exploratory adjustments in their response times in proportion to this difference in uncertainty? And in fact, we found, as we have before, that there's a subgroup of people that we call the explorers that are using relative uncertainty in order to drive their response time adjustments. So on a trial-by-trial -trial basis, you can see that uh, as they're more uncertain about fast responses than slow responses, there's a greater likelihood that they will explore, make a large change in the response time towards fast responses, and vice versa, if they're more uncertain about the slow responses, they'll make an RT adjustment in that direction. Uh, there's another group of participants that also seem to adjust their responses on a trial-by-trial -trial basis, but they just don't seem to do this in a proportion to uncertainty. So this is what we'll call the the non-explorers, or at least they're not using uncertainty to drive exploration. If people are using relative uncertainty in order to guide their exploratory choices, then um, you, one should predict that the brain should be tracking changes in relative uncertainty from trial to trial as people are making their decisions. And from the computational model, we have estimates on every trial of this relative uncertainty value. What we can do is convolve that with a hemodynamic response and, that, and set up a uh, explanatory time series that we then can look for um, in our fMRI data. So taking this approach, 
what we find, consistent with our hypothesis, is that the rostral-lateral prefrontal cortex is the region that tracks relative uncertainty in this continuous way. Moreover, it does so only in those individuals that um, use relative uncertainty for their exploratory choices. And that's evident when one looks individually at just the group of explorers, um, you see that, you see that rostral lateral pre, uh, prefrontal cortex activity correlates with that relative uncertainty signal. And also when you directly compare the explorer, the, those who explore with relative uncertainty against those who don't. Another open question is computationally here we've shown that sort of at the abstract level that people are sensitive to this relative uncertainty. But one of the questions is how do people actually represent these kind of probability distributions in their brain? Um, there's been some work um, by other labs who've tried to show sort of neural mechanisms for maintaining uh, probabilistic population codes and so forth, but there's been very little work in trying to uh, figure out how those population codes might be updated on a trial by trial basis and how they might be used to drive exploration. So it's certainly an open question about the implementation and how exactly the rostrolateral prefrontal cortex in interacting with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain is able to, to make these kinds of computations. The, the fact that RLPFC is tracking relative uncertainty in this task, um, one shouldn't take from that that this is the, you know, a module for relative uncertainty in the brain or it's the only thing that this region d does. And in fact, quite the opposite. What it points at is that this is a very general and, and sort of all-purpose all function of this part of the brain, um, namely the ability to make these relative value comparisons. And it's something that can be applied across a wide range of tasks. And it's consistent with a, a prior literature that has, that has shown that, um, ranging from things like analogy to episodic memory and other types of contexts. So in terms of the functional organization of frontal cortex, um, this is consistent with a view that says that um, its function is fairly abstract and, and, and general and can be applied to different problems um, uh, but, but in terms of their specifics, but is, is really using a much more abstract type of computation.